Okay, so maybe I'll get started. Um, good afternoon. For those of you who are attending your first webinar in this series, I'm Jeremy Allison, and along with Dr. Sigrid Netherer and Andres Gonzalez, we coordinate this uh, working party 7.03.16, Behavioral and Chemical Ecology of Forced Insects. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third webinar of this seminar series. <clears throat> For those of you who are new to IUFRO, IUFRO is the International Union of Forest Research Organiza Organizations, sorry, and it is large with over 15,000 members. IUFRO is composed of several divisions, and this working party resides in Division 7, Forest Health. And the coordinator of this working, or sorry, of this division is Eki Brockerhoff. And there are two units within this division, uh, pathology coordinated by Todd Ramsfield and entomology coordinated by Mark de Klapwick. Within the units, there are working parties, and this working party is 7.03.16, as I indicated. The mission of IUFRO is to advance research excellence, knowledge sharing, and foster the development of science-based solutions to forest challenges, the same more or less as this working party and seminar series. Clearly, our most valuable resource are our networks, and given the importance and size of IUFRO, um, I can think of no better way than to expand and enhance our network by, than by becoming involved and participating. In IUFRO, I encourage all of you to consider one or more of these options. Last week, somebody asked a question about the cost of membership and I realized I, I misspoke. Um, what I meant to say is that if you are employed by a member organization, membership is free. But if you are not, then I believe membership is approximately 100 euros. <clears throat> this is the third webinar in the, the webinar series. As you can see from the, the list of the webinars, we have a diverse collection of topics and speakers, including leaders in their fields and emerging young stars. The format of the webinar um, typically has a webinar or a symposium organizer, in this case, Dr. Manuela Branco, who provides a 10 minute overview approximately to give context to the following 15 to 25 minute research talks. <clears throat> a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Josephine Kwefelek will moderate the question period. If you have a question, you can use the raise hand feature in the chat box, in which case at the appropriate time, Josephine will unmute your microphone and allow you to ask your question directly. Alternatively, you can type your question in the chat box and Josephine will post the question for you. I, I ask that uh, to make Josephine's job a little easier, you try to limit the dialogue in the chat box to questions for speakers. Um, those of you who have colleagues who are unable to attend or want to see the, the webinar later can go to the YouTube channel where the uh, recording of this meeting will be posted. And the coordinators of this party and webinar series have had contact with the editors in chief of the Journal of Insect Behavior. Even if you're not a, a contributing speaker to the webinar series, we would like to hear from you if you have an interest in contributing a paper to a special issue in the Journal of Insect Behavior on the behavior of forest insects. Special thanks go to the, these three individuals. Without them, this webinar series wouldn't um, be possible. When we begin to have in-person meetings again, I encourage you to introduce yourselves to these people, perhaps buy them a coffee or some other beverage. And special thanks also go out to the Forestry and Agrobiotechnology Institute um, for hosting this platform and making the resources available to put on the webinar series. So it's my pleasure to introduce today the coordinator or the organizer of this symposium, Dr. Manuela Branco. It gives me pleasure to um, uh, listen to these talks. Uh, Manuela is from the University of Lisbon, the Forest Protection Research Group. In addition to being a leader in the fields of ecology and management of forest insects, Dr. Branco is a deputy coordinator of Working Party 7.03.06, Integrated, manage Integrated Management of Forest Defoliating Insects. Thank you. All right, Quentin. Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar section, where we'll talk about the sense of smell on predator prey and host parasitoid interactions. First of all, I would like to thank very much to Jeremy, Andres, and Sigrid for the invitation to moderate this section. Also, 
My special thanks to Jean-Claude Grégoire and Sophia Brank that accepted to give their talks on this topic. Well, I will start with a brief introduction. And I will recall that insect predators and parasitoids, they mainly use chemical compounds to locate their prey. And of course, they can use other cues like visual cues, thermal, vibrations, but chemical cues are probably the most important one. Here we can see a parasitoid on the top and a predator on the bottom that both use the sex pheromone of the prey or the host. Chemical signals perceived by predators and parasitoids can be highly diverse. To begin with, at long distance, they can use compounds that give some information about the habitat, like volatile organic compounds produced by the host plants. Or, more specifically, compounds that are produced by the host plants after being damaged by the herbivore insects, which is more informative for the predators or the parasitoids. More specifically, then, predators and parasitoids can use compounds that are associated with the prey itself. These can be compounds that are present in the feces, honeydew, saliva, silk, or even pheromones, which are used for the interspecific communication of the host or the prey. It can be alarm, aggregation, marking, or sex pheromones. And those are more specific, particular sex pheromones, which are highly species specific. As, as we go from the top of this image to the bottom, there is an increased specialization as the predator is using more and more specific chemical cues. And this volatile can act as long range attractants, like uh, sex pheromones, for example. As you can see on the top, this uh, neuroptera is attracted to the sex pheromone of the prey by 100 meters distance or can act as very short range volatile, which can be used to increase the activity of the natural enemy and uh, accept the prey or the host. For a natural enemy to respond to a specific compound, it needs to have particular tools. In specifically, it needs to have other binding proteins and other receptors on their antenna cecilla which will link to the compound like a key. But once the natural enemy acquires this ability, then it will shape dramatically its ecology. In particular, it will shorten the time to locate the brain, which will lead to specialization according to the optimal foraging theory. And also, it will shape dramatically the evolution of the predator and the prey interaction. In particular, if the predator or the parasitoid use the sex pheromone of the prey or the host, it, it will be interfering with the mating of the species. And this will have a strong selective pressure on the, on the prey. As a consequence, we can observe a lowering emission of the sex pheromone in order to speak softly not be listened by the predator or otherwise can, can put be a selective pressure for individuals producing different compounds which we call ferrotypes. This is an example of what could happen in such a particular case. In this case it relates with Planococcus ficus, a mealybug, and for this mealybug Two different compounds were found that could be produced by females and received by males. But only that one on the left, Lamedulus nesuate, is perceived by the parasitoid in this case, Anagirus, Vladimir. And so we can imagine that if in a particular population there will be more individuals, more phenotypes of LI, then they can escape parasitism in this particular case from, for this, from this parasitoid. Another interesting case that we have been following for several years regards the pine bust scales, family Matsukoxidae, genus Matsukoxidae. 
These species are very old bus scales which feeds only on pines. They are very host specific. And here you can see several images of the females, males, and larvae. All of these species occur only on the northern hemisphere, both in Europe, Asia, and North America. And three of them are invasive, namely Matsukoks feitodi in Europe, Matsukoks josephi in the Middle East, and Matsukoks matsumuri in Asia. For these three species, the sex pheromones were identified. They are ketones with a different uh, uh, chain lens, as you can see on the image, and uh, we can use it now for monitoring the pine bus case. But what was really intriguing and exciting is that we also observed that a huge diversity of predators from many different families and even orders could respond to these compounds. This means that this ability evolved several times on different taxa, but also within some taxa, like in a tocoridae. Uh, there is a genus Elatophilus where all the species are predators specific of the pine baskets and many of them are responding to the sex pheromone, which probably means that there is a common ancestor within this uh, uh, genus with the same ability. We also observed that not only the adults, but also the larvae and the nymphs of different taxa could respond to the sex pheromone of this prey which was very interesting. In the field, we have observed very quick responses. In just a few minutes, sometimes just five minutes, some individuals were already arriving after exposing the lures in the tree trunk. And in the lab, another interesting outcome is that we could see associative learning. It, I mean, in the case of Emerovic stigma, if he was reared in a specific prey, it increased its ability to respond to the sex pheromone of that specific prey. We all know that uh, smell chemicals, and in particular sex pheromones, are widely used now in integrated pest management strategies. The question is, can we also use it for improving biological control? And the answer is yes, of course, we can use it in very many different applications. For example, for monitoring natural enemies, for studying the behavior of these enemies, and also for searching for new ones in classical biological control programs, if we have any compound that is associated with the prey or the host. Another possible application of this knowledge would be on augmentative releases of biological control agents. Here you are seeing several devices for the release of the parasitoid, in this case, an Agirus vladimiri, which, which parasite, parasitize several millibug species. If you do this combined with the sex pheromone of Planococcus fix, in fact, you can increase the retention of the parasitoid in a specific area and avoid its dispersal to surrounding habitats. The knowledge on the chemical ecology of predators and parasitoids can have, in fact, many other applications, for example, in push and pull strategies. In this particular case study, we used sentinel millibugs of Planococcus citri baited with sex pheromone of Planococcus fix and there was an increased parasitism on baited traps in regard to control traps, which indicates that we're probably attracting natural enemies from the surrounding area. So in conclusion, the knowledge on the chemical ecology of predators and parasitoids has not only relevance to understand its ecology, behavior, and evolution, also can have many practical applications on integrated pest management strategies, in particular biological control. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that this brief introduction, as well as the two oral presentations that will follow next, will increase your interest for this topic, and I will be most happy to answer to your questions. Okay, so 
uh, in keeping with the format, we will save questions for Manuela for, to the open um, discussion period. But um, if it's okay then with um, Josephine, maybe you can unmute Manuela's microphone so she can introduce the next speaker. Hi, good afternoon to all of, all of you. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce the two speakers that uh, uh, were very kind to offer to, to give their presentation on this topic. It was quite of a challenge for me to be moderator. And to begin with, uh, I would like to present Jean-Claude Grégoire. Jean-Claude is um, a senior professor. He is now retired, but uh, he has an honorary uh, position on the Université Livre de Bruxelles in, Belgica, in Belgium. And um, he has been working in uh, different subjects, uh, but uh, more recently he has been working in the distribution, dispersal capacity um, of the vectors of the Chilella fastidiosa in, in uh, um, um, Belgium. Uh, he's, he has been also very interested in uh, bark beetles. His talk will be about bark beetles. And um, he's studying, has been studying uh, several experts related with its management and uh, behavior, and uh, also with the reproductive behavior and the uh, dispersal of uh, some of these species. Uh, currently, Jean-Claude is also an expert um, working with EFSA, the European Food Safety Society, and with EPO, uh, on, uh, namely on pest risk analysis of quarantine forest pests. So um, I thank, again, I thank very much and Claude, and uh, I will be most happy now to, to listen to his talk. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to join this webinar, and I hope that what I'm going to tell you will be of interest to you. The topic I would like to present during this webinar is the relationship between predators of conifer bark beetles and the, um, their host, their prey, uh, in the sense that the um, Ecological strategies followed by the prey have a deep influence on the ecology and behavior of the predators themselves. And so we would like, we are going to examine some of these relationships uh, along uh, a simplified food web. The food web here involves, includes three different levels. Uh, this is really simplified. We have on the one hand the host trees. Here it is uh, Norway spruce, Picea, Abies, uh, which could be either strong living healthy trees, which would have to be overwhelmed by at mass attack by bark beetles which cannot stand which cannot, uh, uh, which are susceptible to the defenses of the trees, or which could be attacked alive uh, by other bark beetles, which could live the whole uh, life cycle as parasites in a still living host, or still, uh, some in some cases, uh, long dead trees would be attacked by saprophagus bark beetle species. Then we have these different bark beetle species uh, specializing uh, according to the status, the physiological status of the host tree. And then there are lots of predators, not only insects, but also vertebrates and other natural enemies, parasitoids and uh, pathogens which are associated with these systems. Uh, one word of caution here, uh, the uh, trophic web that I'm presenting is extremely simplified. In the reality, there are more layers. There are, level, there, there are enemies of enemies, enemies of enemies of enemies, and so forth and so on. There are pathogens. And in addition to these vertical relationships between species or within species, there are also horizontal 
uh, relationships between or within, within species, um, competition or facilitation. So the, the whole thing is extremely complex. Uh, at the basis of the trophic web I'm considering is the host tree. And the host tree is defended. Um, the spruce, the conifers in general, have preformed and inducible defenses. There are other things, uh, such as uh, uh, stone cells, uh, crystals, fibers, and so on. And there are chemical defenses, uh, most of them belonging to two categories, uh, terpenes and phenolics. And uh, in this simplified view, I'm going to concentrate on monoterpenes. Monoterpenes could be extremely toxic to many insects, and we conducted toxicity tests towards bark beetles and towards some of their associates. This was done with Claude Evrard and his team in Dijon in the late 1980s. And we used two different bark beetles, Ips typographus, which needs to kill trees in order to establish in them, and Dendroctonus micans, which is able to live its whole life cycle in living trees. And uh, in parallel to the bark beetles, we also uh, analyzed the, um, the toxicity towards two associates belonging to the same family of monotomids, monotomid beetles, the generalist Rhizophagus dispar, which is sometimes a predator, sometimes fungivore, sometimes detritivore, and the truly predatory grandis, which is closely associated to Dendroctonus micans. So Claude developed two types of tests. One was testing saturated vapors. The insects were enclosed in a chamber communicating to another chamber where uh, single monoterpenes, single pure monoterpenes were uh, introduced in amount sufficient to keep saturated vapor during the 24 hours of the test. The monoterpenes were selected, selected according to a list published by Heeman and Frank uh, in 1977 uh, of uh, monoterpenes produced by uh, Norway spruce. Uh, another category of tests were uh, topical applications where droplets of uh, the single monoterpenes were applied to the ventral sternites of uh, adults or the whole body of larvae of the, the, the different species considered. And after 20 hours, we counted the dead, the dead insects and the paralyzed insects. So I'm not going into deeply into the results. What you need to, uh, to keep in mind is that basically Ips typographus and Rhizophagus dispar, the species more susceptible and uh, work, uh, living mostly in uh, dead or dying trees, were much more susceptible than Dendroctonus micans, adults or larvae, or Rhizophagus grandis, males and females. Rhizophagus grandis, as you can see, was almost totally uh, resistant to the monoterpenes, and it was the case also for the larvae of Dendroctonus micans, which could live in, in full resin sometimes if necessary. The same with topical applications. We can see that, in fact, larvae and uh, adults of Dendroctonus micans were very resistant, whilst the uh, Ipsiphogas uh, was not. You might wonder why we tested only female adults of Dendroctonus micans. That is because in this species, the sex ratio is very much biased and only single fertilized, single females fertilized in their brood chambers, in the brood chambers where they, they were born, fertilized by uh, brothers, would establish singly uh, a new colony. Uh, for the associates, the situation is the same, and you can see that uh, uh, Rhizophagus grandis was extremely resistant uh, to doses equivalent to 12 or 15% of their own weight, whilst Rhizophagus dispar was much more sensitive. So we end up with 
two different types of bark beetles. And um, this uh, susceptibility to uh, resin or resistance to monotopins could be reflected also in uh, the associations they have with natural enemies. Uh, natural enemies mean, in this case, uh, parasitoids and predators. And you can see that Ips typographus from different reviews uh, is associated with 86 species of natural enemies, none of which are specific, meaning that these natural enemies uh, would uh, be associated with other bark beetle species. And on the other hand, Ips typographus has several bark beetle competitors, such as, in this case, Pityogenes calcographus or uh, Ilurgops paliatus, for example. On the other hand, Dendroctonus micans has uh, nine associated species, among which actually two are regular and very specific, and that is one eichnomonid parasitoid dolicomitus terebrans and one monotonid, monotomid predator Rhizophagus grandis, and the others are very occasional and anecdotal. They are found only in older galleries where the surrounding phloem uh, is dead because of the beetle activity and where uh, the, the resin concentration is much lower. So at the trophic web level, this translates into the fact that the uh, Bark beetles susceptible, uh, susceptible to monotopines have to single out one tree, either a, a dead tree or a, a living tree that they would mass attack. And this single tree would be uh, producing, would be uh, inhabited by many, many uh, bark beetles at the same time, and therefore would become a, a strong emitter of semiochemical signals. It would be kind. It would be uh, a kind of semiochemical beacon, you know, attracting other species, other individuals from everywhere else in the stand. And actually, there are lots of species, as I, I said earlier, which are going to join this system. Whilst Dendroctonus micans, in fact, if a female would be able to select almost any single tree in the stand, and on, on the tree, the female would look at more suitable sites and then just create one brood chamber, and usually there is a several generations of the bark beetles, and of course, it provides an excellent environment for specialized predators which have no competitors. So we are going to compare these two systems using two proxies. For the Ips typographus system, we are going to look at Tanazimus fornicarius, which is a polyphago species attacking at least 27 different species, species of scolitinae, including ambrosia beetles. Uh, there is, for instance, uh, uh, an antennal receptor uh, sensitive to lineatin, the pheromone of trypodendron lineatum. And uh, in fact, these insects, Tanazimus formicarius, have receptors for many prey and host tree volatiles. Uh, it is also characterized, I'll go back to that later, to a kind of suicidal oviposition uh, connected to the fact that many uh, hosts, some, some also vulnerable. On the other hand, we have the narrowly specific Rhizophagus grandis, which is extremely accurate in its prey location, and which has a series of uh, uh, signals, responds to a series of signals for oviposition, for the starting of oviposition, and for stopping oviposition, uh, as we are going to see later. So back to Tanazimus formicarius. So males and females are landing on trees under attack by bark beetles, and they would grab landing bark beetles and feed on them. And they will also, the females will also oviposit under the scales of the bark, and the tiny larvae would enter bark beetle galleries and feed 
upon everything they meet in these galleries, uh, bark beetles, uh, conspecifics, uh, other species, and they could even tunnel through the phloem uh, to join other galleries. And since the trees are mass attacked, it means that the whole tree is open to, for, for their predation. And then pupation occurs in a, leash, a niche uh, created within the outer bark. So the risks facing, uh, uh, faced by Tanazimus are a variable and unpredictable supply of prey because um, they are not always susceptible trees in the stand and uh, bark beetle populations are not uh, dense enough be able to mass attack living trees. So some species could be available and others not, uh, and this could vary from year to year. And so in answer to, to these, uh, these risks, the, the species is hedge betting, meaning that they would attack many different types of prey, and that would be at least 27 species, and that they, have, they would have also a very long flight period, uh, uh, superior uh, to four months, and this flight period would overlap the flight periods of the, uh, all the, the prey species. So this gives more opportunity for the predator to find prey and to uh, complete its life cycle. But there are trade-offs, and there are three types of trade-offs. One is that, uh, uh, well, actually, there is one trade-off, major trade-off. It, it's the fact that pupation occurs in the outer bark and that the bark of many host trees is not thick enough to allow pupation. And if you look at the graph on the left side of the slide, you will see that uh, there is a recording of bark thickness of different spruces uh, in the south of Belgium. And uh, overlaid to this graph is a picture at the same scale of uh, uh, pupal niche, and you can see that except for the two first meters uh, along the stem of the, the spruce, bark thickness is uh, lower than the, the, uh, the, the, the size of the uh, pupal niches, which of course causes a problem. So how does it work out? We have some laboratory evidence. Uh, we did an experiment in the lab with spruce logs uh, pre-infested with Ips typographus and in which we have introduced larvae of Thanasimus formicarius. And then we had a second series of spruce logs treated on the same way, but covered with a kind of artificial bark layer in addition, which would be, which was made out of papier mâché. And then we had a third series of logs, which were pine logs, with the same bark beetles and uh, predator larvae inside. And after all these logs were enclosed in cages so that we could record immigration, emigration of the insects. And at the end of the life cycle, uh, of the, the immature uh, life of the insects in the logs, each log was carefully searched, uh, looking for uh, pupae and prepupae. And what we found out was that there were pupae and prepupae uh, in the papier mache and in the outer bark of the pine logs, but not so much in the outer bark of the spruce log, which was much thinner. And on the other hand, there was a huge emigration, uh, mostly from the spruce logs. And if we translate that into relationship to bark thickness, we can say that th there is a positive relationship between pupation rates and bark thickness, uh, whilst there is a negative relationship between emigration and bark thickness. So in the field, it was possible also to measure this impact of uh, uh, unsuitable pupation sites. Uh, Nathalie Warze did a really nice set of experiments. She nailed collecting funnels at the base of tr spruce trees attacked by Ipsipographus and where uh, larvae of Thanasimus formicarius were present, and she collected 
large amounts of these prepupae per funnel. And she was even able to show using pitfall traps that many of these larvae would try to venture outside of the tree uh, in, in search for a suitable uh, pupation site, which would undoubtedly up with significant mortality, although we were not able to, to test this. So are there practical applications? Yes. Uh, we, we can see that we, we know from field data, and this is on the uh, right side of the slide, uh, data from the Vosges uh, mountains in northeast France in the early years 2000, that stands, spruce stands containing um, some pine at least, uh, harbor more shelter more tanazimus than pure spruce stands. Uh, we had uh, trapping networks with traps baited with uh, uh, its dienol, uh, cisverbenol, methylbutenol, and we caught variable numbers of uh, uh, tanazimus and of uh, ips typographus. And you can see that all the sites marked with a star were sites containing a few pines. And uh, there we had more than azimuth than in other stands. Uh, that could translate in the possibility that if some restocking has to be made in stands uh, after heavy thinning or after a clear cutting, some pines could be added to the spruce. The pines uh, working as sources and uh, the, the spruce as sinks in the metapopulation uh, dynamics. Another uh, outcome of this information is uh, in the assessment of attempts at biology. Uh, some past attempts were unsuccessful, and that was probably because the insects were unable to pupate in the host tree of the bark beetles, which were the targets. Now, with Rhizophagus grandis. Uh, so, the insects, male and female adults, locate root chambers, enter the root chambers, feed uh, on uh, all the immature stages within the root chambers of the endroctonus mecans and oviposit in the frass. And the larvae also uh, feed on all immature stages of the endroctonus mecans in these root chambers. So the benefits of that is that the prey is most of the time available. In Belgium, for instance, we have uh, one or two galleries of dendroctonus micans per hectare, and this is fairly stable. Uh, and on the other hand, another benefit is the fact that there is reduced, reduced competition for a prey because it is defended by its living host tree. But there are four types of challenges. One is that the predators need to accurately locate their prey at low density. The second is that they need to decide to oviposit only if there is food available, if there are larvae in the, the brood chambers. And a, second, a, fourth, a third challenge is that they also need to learn, to, to know how to stop ovipositing when the carrying capacity is reached. And then a last challenge is that the larvae have to fully exploit uh, the prey which is available in these broad chambers, considering that uh, these broad chambers are isolated in the tree, and so they provide only limited resources. So the first challenge, uh, how to um, accurately locate the prey, that could be observed in the field if we look uh, at uh, root chambers in natural conditions in Belgium, for instance, we can first see that the root chambers last for a long time. That could be between one and three years, providing a long-term resource to uh, the predators. And we can see on the graph on the left that an increasing proportion of these root chambers is colonized as they grow older. And then another uh, approach is in the lab, we identify, identified in uh, uh, screen walking screen tests under a gradient of order and also in flying wind, uh, wind tunnel, flight tunnel test, we uh, 
uh, identified a series of volatile uh, oxygenated monoterpenes which were attracting Rhizophagus. And actually, a mixture of these volatiles could be used in the field to monitor the presence of these predators. So once a predator has found a gallery, it has to decide whether to oviposit or not. And we know that because we analyzed uh, volatiles uh, present in, in the brood chambers produced by the frass, and we found out that a mixture of some volatiles was able to elicit successful oviposition uh, under artificial conditions. But that's not all. There is a third challenge, which is that oviposition posi position has to stop once a, suf a sufficient number of uh, uh, predator larvae has been produced. Otherwise, there would be overexploitation of uh, the prey. And this could be investigated in the lab in artificial brood chambers, plastic boxes with living larvae of Neanderthalus micans and uh, pieces of fresh uh, spruce bark. And uh, we added one, two, or three females into these boxes. And what we found was that uh, um, whatever, irrespective of the number of females per box, the number of larvae in the boxes remained uh, grossly the same, meaning that each female uh, oviposited less, produce, produced less eggs if there were more females in, in the box, keeping the, the total amount of uh, predator larvae inside uh, rather low. We don't know yet which are the chemicals involved. So, and the last challenge is that prey has to be uh, exploited fully before they decay. And on the right side of this uh, uh, slide, you can see that uh, uh, more and more larvae aggregate on a prey, and that uh, this, uh, this produces curves with, with an exponential growth against time, suggesting the existence of uh, uh, recruitment. So there is an aggregation pheromone. The application of that is that Dendroctonus micans is the only species uh, for which a successful uh, biocontrol uh, uh, process has been established in uh, uh, the Caucasus Mountain in Georgia and Turkey, as well as in France and in the UK. And it is also to be observed under natural conditions in many other countries, such as Belgium or Germany. But uh, we cannot necessarily translate this for other species. And we tried to apply that uh, against Dendroctonus valens in North, uh, in China, valens of uh, problem there. So with this, I, I want still to uh, acknowledge uh, the uh, many, many friends and colleagues for uh, uh, fruitful discussion and uh, fantastic work in the field and in the lab. The, the list is long and it is not complete. And last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude, for the talk. Sigrid, uh, do you have a question for Jean-Claude? Now I'm here, sorry for that. Jean-Claude, thank you also from my side for this really interesting talk. I learned some new details about the predators of Hypstypographus and Dendroctonus. Um, my question is, because the audio was disturbed at that point, could you explain again uh, your term of suicidal oviposition? I would really like to know <laughs> more exactly what that is. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, good. The, I, I use this term suicidal oviposition because they, they seem to oviposit sometimes in some host trees which do not have a sufficiently thick outer bark. And therefore, the prepupae cannot find a site where they could uh, 
create a small niche wide enough to accommodate themselves. And, and so the, the prepupae leave some of the trees. And for instance, they leave very often spruce trees. And this is why in Belgium, in pure spruce stands, we have almost no tanazimus because they cannot sustain there. They, 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 they just uh, uh, spend their larva life in the trees and they, they disappear. And we have only tanazimus in spruce stands when we have pine nearby because the pine would provide the tanazimus and they would go to their doom, to the doom of their, their bro the offspring uh, in the spruce. This is really interesting. I wonder if it has something to do with the age structure of uh, Nova Spruce uh, stands, that Nova Spruce is not old enough to provide the yeah. required bark thickness. You, you know, we, we, we did some measurements on, on uh, rather large spruce trees. So it, it could vary maybe from country to country or from a spruce variety to variety. Mm -hmm. but, but in our case, it, even in quite large, you know, two cubic meter spruce stems, we, we found that only the, the, the first or two basal meters were uh, thick enough. And, and okay. usually they, they were so also so uh, so difficult for the beetles to uh, to use because of uh, stone cells and, and mm -hmm. lignin that anyway, there were not so many barbecue galleries there in the two first meters. In, in Austria, in a natural reserve, we did research and we had a lot of tanazimus there. Okay. And it was, there was a lot of spruce, but it was a very old forest with trees up to 200 years old. So maybe that's also a reason, or the provenance, yes. as you said. Quite. Were there any pines or other species mixed with the spruce in your natural mm, reserve? Not so many, no. Okay. It was a mountain spruce forest with beech, not so many pines, maybe large. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a, two questions in the chat box. Um, can the pre-pupae uh, pre pupate in the soil or do they need to find another tree? And what about other conifer species that, like larynx? Well, I don't think they can pre-pupate in the soil, but we have not tested that. We, we know that they could uh, pre Pupate, uh, pupate in uh, uh, styrofoam, for instance, but this is similar in texture somehow to the, the outer bark. But larix, I don't know. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Um, I welcome I don't see further questions, but if there are more questions coming up later, I will bring them back during the discussion. Otherwise, uh, Manuela can introduce the next speaker. Yes, of course. And uh, thank you very much, Jean Claude, for your very interesting presentation. So I will introduce now Sofia, Sofia Branco. Well, we have the same name, but we are not relatives. I must say this. Uh, Sofia is a young researcher. She has done her PhD recently in the new University of Lisbon with the team of Professor Maria Rosa Paiva. And she has studied the chemical ecology of uh, Goniptus platensis, which is a uh, weevil that feeds on eucalyptus. And it's quite relevant uh, for, for us because it's the main pest in our uh, eucalyptus plantations. So the study that she's going to present now regards the, um, the studies that she has done in particular with the parasitoid, um, the egg parasitoid and the response of the hecparasitoids to some of the compounds associated with the, with the prey. Sophia is now doing a, a postdoc. She's currently working on a new project, OMED, Holistic Management of Emerging Forest Pests and Diseases, which is coordinated by Hervé Jactel from IRA. And uh, she's uh, now studying uh, other subjects, namely uh, eradication process, of invasive species. So uh, I'm uh, quite excited to, to hear now the presentation then by Sophia. And uh, thank you again, uh, Sophia, for your work. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank the organization for putting up this webinar. 
and also to thank Manuela for inviting me. And today we will be talking a bit about host location by egg parasitoids. This presentation is divided into sections. I will first give a brief introduction on how egg parasitoids track their hosts. This has been already approached by Manuela, but I will give a bit follow up with examples. And then I will present a study that was conducted with the Nafis nitins, that is the egg parasitoid of the eucalyptus weevil Goniptrus. So parasitoids they find their hosts by following a series of dynamic sequential steps. This can be briefly summarized as host habitat location, host location, and finally host selection and acceptance. Each of the steps is mediated by a combination of different stimuli. Chemicals are known to play a major role on this process and this on a continuum from long to shorter and shorter range cues. Um, host habitat location implies finding the host food source, preferably with the host already present. Plant volatiles are known to attract parasitoids from great distances. This type of cue is usually easily detected due to the high plant biomass and consequently high amount of volatiles that are produced. However, it is not a reliable cue of host presence unless specific volatiles induced by herbivory or bioviposition are produced. Once the female parasitoid reaches its host habitat, it will then search for cues that are indicative of host presence. And this is where egg parasitoids are faced with a huge detectability problem because the stage they depend on the egg, while well, it's quite inconspicuous. Eggs are small, they are sessile, they do not feed, they do not release feces, and so they lack the long-range cues that might be exploited by their enemies. In evolutionary terms, they suffer an enormous selection pressure to remain as chemically invisible as possible so that they remain hidden from potential predators and parasitoids. So how do egg parasitoids solve this? Well, they rely on chemical cues from basically anything that might be associated with the eggs. Cues originating from the adult host, from host products, from host plants, organisms associated with host presence, or from interactions from all of these sources. So this is done in a multi-trophic context. They use cues from different trophic levels. Uh, despite these many possibilities, there are three main strategies that uh, egg parasitoids use to track their hosts. And the first one is to use chemicals from other stages of the host than the one that is actually under attack. This strategy was termed as infochemical detour by Vettendick in 1992. They may use cues originating from the interaction of the herbivore and its food. This can be either plant volatiles induced by host feeding or volatiles induced by egg deposition. And finally, they may in some cases learn to link easy to detect but unreliable cues to reliable but hard to detect stimuli. So they rely on associative learning. Of these strategies, the infochemical detour one, which is based on the ability to spy or to eavesdrop on indirect host related cues, such as host pheromones and allomones, is assumed to be the main one that is used by female parasitoids when they are tracking their hosts. And this was first demonstrated with attraction to sex pheromones. Lewis in 1982 found that eggs of the cotton bollworm, Eliotazea, were more heavily parasitized by trichogramma in cotton plots when these were treated with synthetic sex pheromone of the moth. Attraction to, attraction to calling females was later confirmed. Since then, many studies have demonstrated chemical espionage on the sex pheromones of moths by egg parasitoids. In some cases, however, the chiromone used by the parasitoid is a compound that is associated with host pheromone production rather than the pheromone itself. Um, attraction to anti-sex pheromones has also been reported. For instance, Trichogramma brassica was shown to be attracted to the anti-sex pheromone of the large cabbage white Pieris brassica. In this species, males transfer an antiphrodisiac compound during mating and this to make the females less attractive to other males. When this compound was artificially applied on virgin females, uh, they applied benzyl cyanide on virgin females, 
This induced attraction of the female wasps with, which mounted on the butterflies. And this is a case where the parasitoid is a phoretic species. That is, it uses the adult stage as a mean of transportation. It hitchhikes. This is something that is not at all uncommon in egg parasitoids. They basically, they take a ride with the adult stage of the hosts. And as soon as it lays their eggs, they dismount and have the so wanted egg host delivered directly at their doorstep. Other studies have shown the attraction of egg parasitoids to mated host females and gravid females of other species. My last example of an use of an infochemical detour strategy is exploitation of aggregation pheromones by et, uh, parasitoids of Heteroptera. Because in Heteroptera, males are responsible for the emission of a pheromone that is attractive to both sexes. And what was observed in an experiment with the leaf-footed plant bug Leptoglossus australis was that traps that were baited with males attracted not only males and females, but also high numbers of parasitoid Grian pensylvanicum, whereas traps that were baited with females did not capture any. In addition, when eggs were placed near traps with males, the parasitism rates were higher than when eggs were placed alone. Uh, regarding the exploitation of cues that originate from the interaction of the herbivore and its food, these may be plant volatiles that are induced by host feeding, as mentioned before, and this is adaptive when all developmental stages co-occur in the same plant. So there is an indirect association of feeding adults or nymphs with the presence of eggs. So this provides a somehow reliable cue. An even more re reliable cue occurs when specific compounds are released by the oviposition, are induced by oviposition. And the example of, uh, here present is that oviposition by the elm leaf beetle induces ulmus plants to produce volatiles, not, not only one compound, but a blend of volatiles that attract the egg parasitoid, or Mises galeruca. And the, this, comp, this, this compound blend is not produced when the plant is artificially scrapped. It is not emitted by the eggs itself. It is not possible to just mix the eggs and the plant and obtain this emission and instead only when the beetle actually oviposits are they released and attract the parasitoids. Uh, I will now pass to the second section of my presentation, that is a study on the olfactory responses of anaphenes mittens to host and habitat cues. This was part of the work that was conducted during my PhD at Faculty of Sciences and Technology under the supervision of Professor Maria Rosa Paiva and Eduardo Matheus, and also with the cooperation of Professor Stefan Schutz from Gottingham University. During my PhD, I started by studying the chemical ecology of the host of Gonyptrus, because this species is a severe pest of eucalyptus in many world regions, and little to nothing was known on its chemical ecology, no pheromones had been identified, and we were able to demonstrate that the males are uh, emitting uh, compounds that are attractive to both virgin males and females of the species. And so they are responsible for the emission of an aggregation pheromone. We carried on then to study the chemical ecology of the parasitoids, because in regions where control is achieved, this is brought solely by the action of the parasitoid which in many cases manages to keep the uh, populations of the weevil below the economic threshold of damage. And what was known beforehand was that Anaphis nitens females are highly effective at locating freshly laid egg capsules. They often take less than one day to locate and parasitize them. But the mechanisms by which these female parasitoids detect and select the hosts was completely unknown. And so the main objectives of this work were to identify chemical cues that might mediate host location and selection by anaphysnitans. 
and this included QC emitted by the host, that is Gonipterus potensis egg capsules, other stages of the, of the host, such as adult feces and pheromones, and also compounds emitted by eucalyptus globules, that is the plant upon which the host feeds. In terms of more specific objectives, we wanted to determine which compounds are detected by Anaphes nitens antenna. And these compounds emitted by globules, Gonipterus patensis, males and females, and by feces and egg capsules. And of these compounds that are detected by the antenna, which of them elicit a behavioral response? Regarding the methodology, we started by establishing cultures of the insects, both of Gonipterus and of Anaphis. For the extraction of volatile compounds, different techniques were used. The first was headspace solid face micro extraction. These samples were used solely for volatile fraction characterization. The remaining techniques used allowed for the obtention of extracts. So in addition to volatile fraction characterization, this could also be used for replicate electrophysiological and behavioral biosaves. The techniques used were simultaneous distillation extraction, solvent extraction, and monotrap discs to extract live insects. For the characterization of the volatile fraction, gas chromatography with quadrupole mass spectrometry was used with different systems, columns of different polarity, and with different temperature programs. To determine which compounds were perceived by the antenna of an office, a GCMS electron tenographic system was used. In the system, the gas coming from the GC column is equally split between the antenna, which is connected to an electron tenographic system, and the mass spectrometer. And so it allows for simultaneously determining which compounds elicit an antenna response and their identification all in one run. The behavioral biosays were conducted in Petri dish arenas in a setup as illustrated in this figure. Each arena was divided in four quadrants with the stimulus in one of the quadrants and controls in the remaining three. The wasps were released in the central area of the arena and the time spent in each of the quadrants was registered for 20 minutes. Non-parametric tests were applied to determine if there were difference in the time spent between quadrants and if the person time spent in the lower quadrant differed from the expected value of 25%. As for the results, we were able to show that an AFIS antenna is able to detect 28 compounds emitted by eucalyptus globulus, many of which are also emitted by gonipterus, and that at least 15 compounds that are produced by Gonipterus are detected by the Anaphis antenna. That is, they actively spy on compounds produced by the adults. Five of these compounds were only detected in Gonipterus feces and egg capsules, and one of them was only detected in the egg capsules and female feces. It was absent from male feces. Regarding the behavioral trials conducted and starting with the fresh materials that was tested, attraction was observed to egg capsules and to mated female feces and also to eucalyptus globulus, whereas no attraction was observed to mated male feces. For the individual compounds of eucalyptus that were tested, attraction was observed to eucalyptol, this is the main component of eucalyptus globulus, and also to gamma terpenin. In addition, attraction was observed to cis at the lowest concentration tested. This compound had previously been identified as the main component of the aggregation pheromone of gonipterus. Now, based on these results, it is now possible to propose a well a oversimplified hypothesis for the process of host location by the female wasps where Cineol and gamma terpenin may act as long to intermediate range cues for host habitat location. Cisverbenol, which is emitted by male gonipterus, is used to locate infested areas, that is, which we have shown that a infochemical detour is used in this species, and at close range, compounds present in egg capsules and female feces in combination with physical cues may be used to finally locate the hosts. We know now that compounds that are used for long to intermediate range host location by the parasitoids may help 
to attract or to maintain them in weevil attacked areas and so be used in integrated pest management programs. And finally, I would like to thank to all my colleagues that somehow contributed to this work during my, the development of my PhD and to my funding institutions. And of course, thank you all for the attention. Thank you, Sofia. Um, Andres, do you have a question for Sofia? Hi. So, oh, can, you hear me? can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear Good. you. Good. I have a rather general question. Um, I hope that's okay. Both Manuela in, the in her introduction and, and yourself uh, during the first half of, of your talk mentioned about this uh, associative learning, um, uh, this idea of uh, parasito is getting better and better. And, and I, I was wondering whether you can comment on that regarding the, an, an application point of view, an applied point of view, whether that can be taken to to uh, biofabrics and, and make parasitoids more efficient, maybe? It, it's, a, it's a broad question, so. Yes, uh, it is a very broad question, but I assume <laughs> that, uh, as Manuela said, if you rear the parasitoids on a given, uh, on a given host with an associative, associate plant conditions that you, to the place where you want to release them, that will give them a cue of uh, that things that might be associated with that particular system. So when those parasitoids are reared on those conditions and then released on the, on the field, they will be more efficient at locating the, the eggs than under other conditions. Um, this may be for parasitoids that can, uh, for in anaphys, it is very specific. It's only for eucalyptus and for ganyptus, but there are egg parasitoids that are not so, dependent on one plant species. The, the host is not uh, only attacking one plant species. But if you want it to go and, and attack the eggs that are being laid on that plant species, you can maybe rear them. On, so. I don't know if this yeah. is yeah. Uh, and, and has that been shown specifically in, 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 in several systems to, yes, to actually that, happen? That I do not know. If Demonstrated. I don't know if Manuela has any uh, idea if that, this has been used, but well, uh, I assume that it could be. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I, I'm I'm not aware of any practical application that has been done so far, Andres. We mm -hmm. could imagine that uh, before uh, releasing parasitoids in the wild, if you are going to do augmentative release or another biocontrol strategies, we could uh, rear on specific colonies and uh, specific that we know that they are producing specific compounds. But uh, this is only in theory. Uh, in, practic in practical, I did not uh, don't, do not know any study on, on this respect. But I think it's a potentiality. To, yes. to learn more about it. Is it is very interesting. Thank you. I think Jeremy had a question, I think. Yes. So, Sophia, I'm interested in your, um, your Petri dish bioassay. <clears throat> um, you, you referred to demonstration of attraction. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, as I'm sure you're you're familiar, you know, the, the difficulty there is if you're using residence time, it's hard to differentiate between attraction and arrestment. Did you have any evidence from your system that there was directed movement towards the volatile source or, or were they arrested when they entered into that quadrant in the presence of well, they the moved. A bit, they moved a bit, of course, on the the petri dish, and uh, I was considering the time of the time present in the the lower quadrant. If they spent more time than that, what we expected, then I assumed that there was some kind of attraction to that uh, to that stimulus. In some cases, well, with the eggs, of course, they went and immediately uh, arrested on the eggs. On other stimulus, sometimes they went on the quadrant and walked around the quadrant, spent more time in it. But well, they were not exactly—I um, don't know if not to say this—not arrestment. 
There was, however, a, a trial with uh, one compound that was interesting that is, was not shown in this presentation. That was Verbenon. And this compound that shown to be uh, attractive to mated females of Gonipterus. And when we released the females on the Petri dishes, the, um, none of them released the central area, none. And this was not uh, common. The, there was always a percentage of females that did not leave that central, did not move but about 70% of them did. And for Verbenon, none left the central area of the arena. They just continually swirled on circles like this. There was some kind of evidence that was some arrestment in there. There was a high concentration of the compound, maybe too high for them to be able to choose anything. And so they were arrested in the central area of the arena. But otherwise, for the other compounds tested, I did not uh, really see if they were being arrested by the exact stimulus so it was just being more time in that lure than in the others not okay thank you answer the question <laughs> yes um i believe we can open the discussion uh, so we have a question for jean claude um, have you detected the presence of competition among the insect predators of the Ips species through behavioral experiments, or is it an observation? Does this competition show dependence on the density of the prey, the bark beetles? No, I have not had any direct approach to that, but there are other studies who suggest that uh, when you have several species competing from the same resource, there, there is necessarily competition, or there could be also predation of uh, parasitized insect and uh, interactions of that kind. Thank you. Um, so there is no further question in the chat box, but uh, don't hesitate to add more questions. Uh, so Jeremy has a question. So Jean-Claude, I, <clears throat> I was wondering, um, the evidence you had for the rhizophagus grandis and the avoidance of over-exploitation of the D. mycans uh, prey, is there any evidence that females, do they need to land or enter or you know, be on the gallery before they can detect or you know, make that decision? Or is there any evidence that pre-alightment there are stimuli available to them well, no, we, we don't have that kind of evidence. The, the, the fact is that we find in the field rather often several adults which were not born there because they are new, they, they are new prey systems. And so we know that they, they, they came from the outside and, and you can have at the same time several females. And, and I suppose that this is what they do. They, 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 their first priority is to find a prey system and then to decide how much they could have deposit in, in, into this system. And, and then they might as well leave this system and try again somewhere else. I mean, there is also some hedge betting in, in this species, but it will be uh, between different uh, systems of, of the same prey in this case. And so would you predict that as females age, their, you know, that their willingness or that, the, you know, the likelihood that they avoid ovipositing would change? Well, we, we know that when females have laid a sufficient number of eggs, they, they don't fly so willingly and they don't uh, respond anymore to, to care hormones. So th there is an age dependent uh, connection between the capacity to fly and the response to care hormones uh, and the, the, these predators. So uh, I guess that if oviposition is also correlated to age, so females which are aging have laid already some eggs and then they, they, they are less and less interested in, in going on. Thank you. You're welcome. I have another question, Jean Claude, um, regarding this experiment with the monoterpenes. Uh, this is quite a <laughs> time ago, but I wonder, uh, I still wonder uh, in which relation were the concentrations of externally applied monoterpenes to the natural concentration in resin or in the bark? 
but I guess it was quite a high concentration. And so to which con extent can these results be transferred to natural conditions? So is it realistic at all? Yeah, I, I agree. We, we probably overdid it. But, but on the other hand, we, we wanted to, to show differences between species. And even when overdoing it, we, we, we were able to show that uh, Dendroctonus micans and on the other hand, Rhizophagus grandis were quite safe. But I, I agree that th these amounts are probably not those met uh, under natural conditions. But, but it was still striking, I mean, uh, with these monstrous amounts mm -hmm. that, that some species would escape and, and others would be less uh, living less easily. And I, I guess there's still a link between the, the, the chemical defense on, of the spruce and the fact that the beetles need to mass attack them to, to be able to establish. Yeah, or to classify these compounds. So, sorry, I, I didn't get the beginning of your sentence. That uh, species like Gibbs are also associated with other species that help them to detoxify these compounds, maybe in, in opposite to uh, Dendroctonus micans. I don't know if it also has associates that are involved in, I don't know, host finding or detoxification. Maybe, I, I don't know, but I remember some experiments that you did. You, you managed to induce Ips typographus to attack living spruce. I remember these boxes, these cages you put against the, the trunks. And how, how often was that successful? How, how many beetles succeeded and how many beetles died? Uh, I was always wanting to ask you this, so <laughs> this is the opportunity. <laughs> yes, uh, it was successful in, in, in quite a few cases, actually, but okay. I only looked at the very beginning of the attack, so I did not uh, okay. follow up. I removed the beetles again, so there was just a difference. I saw the difference in the defense capability of the tree, so most of the time the trees were able to just repel the beetles by resin, but in some cases uh, beetles were just successfully boring. But it was just the very beginning, so yeah, no okay. idea how, how this would have ended for the tree. Probably it would have ended fatal for the beetles. Yeah, this is still my belief that, in fact, in a living tree, either it is really overwhelmed by the mass attack or it's not very yeah. successful. It's not very often that we see just a patch on, on an attack yeah. spruce. Huh? Uh, we have a question from Manuela and Sofia. Can a general correlation be made between host finding strategies by parasitoids and the insect host order? Well, uh, well, I can start to, to answer and then Sophia may, uh, may add something else. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a very interesting question. And um, I don't think really uh, there will be a relationship with insect host order, but maybe with, um, with other traits like the habitat, for example, or even the stage, as Sophia showed, uh, finding the, the eggs is uh, much more difficult probably than finding the larval or adult stages in some cases. So for example, for bark beetles, as well as for the pine bust caves, the examples I give, these hosts are concealed. They are, they are hidden uh, inside the, the, the bark. And so they are more difficult to find um, uh, using the other cues. And um, chemical ones might be very relevant on these particular cases. So the, I, I don't know any review on uh, relating uh, host fighting strategies with the host order. Um, probably it will be an interesting subject to, to do, maybe a revision about what is happening. But I would suspect that it's more related with the, with the other trays than the taxonomic trays. And uh, I don't know if Sufi wants to add something more. Uh, and, I, I do not have much more to add that uh, I am not aware of any re review also that might make uh, some kind of correlation. I would probably see more correlation on the, not the host order, but on the parasitoid order. And those I think that are already 
bit described well scarce in the literature but they there is of course some some type of correlation on the thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a question for Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Manuela, Jean-Claude, um, and Sophia for your talk. I really enjoyed it. And uh, especially, Sophia, I have a question for you. I was wondering <coughs> if you know the time between um, the Gonepterus female laying eggs and the time they are going to get parasitized. Uh, the reason I'm asking is because I know in some insects, uh, some pheromones come from oxidation of heavier compound like cuticular hydrocarbon. And I thought maybe do you think uh, similar um, system can happen here where uh, there is some heavy compound on the eggs which get oxidized and then really some attractive compound to the parasite? Well, we, from what we observed from the compounds from the eggs, well, they're mainly the same as they are in, on the feces of the females because on, on an aphis, the, the eggs are late covered in feces. So this is a particular, a particular case where maybe the, um, the well, in Vaniptus they're covered in feces and the aphis may be more uh, trying to locate uh, initially the feces of females, of mated females, because there was one compound that was a very low volatility, volatility compound that was identified only from mated female feces. Not, it was not present on, on male feces. And we know from other studies, not from, our, from ours, that they, take, they can take less than one day to locate the eggs. This is quite fast. They can they take less than one day and they can distinguish between eggs that are already parasitized and eggs that are not that that we do not know how they differentiate yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you just saying. Yeah, you said you had a question for Sophia. Yes, yeah, sorry, okay. Um, so Sophia, I'm curious the with these phoretic egg parasitoids. I mean, so clearly they can try to orient and, and locate um, egg clutches on their own. But I'm wondering, do they only ever get one ride, or do they try to you know mount the the female before she finishes an oviposition event again? I have no idea <laughs> on that. I do not know if it is common from them to remount the female to go to a new location. That uh, I am not aware of it, but um, probably there are studies showing that, but I don't really know, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, there are no more questions in the chat box and no raised hands. We'll still have a few minutes for discussion or Jeremy, if you want to add something. So if there's no other questions, I guess I'll add uh, Jean-Claude a question about the, for the, the predators, is the physiological mechanism like that the, the predators use to respond or to deal with the, the monoterpenes known? Uh, you, you mean the, the, the antennal receptors and those things? No, no. The, the, so how are the predators dealing with those toxic compounds, in particular? Oh, okay. the, Okay, I, I don't think it is known. No, okay. no. Oh. But, but, but again, the, the larvae of Tanazimus usually live in an, in an environment which is not so rich in monoterpenes because the trees are dead or dying. Yeah. Okay. All right. So if there are no other questions, um, I hope to see you all again in two weeks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Bye. For, for thank you very much yes, for the invitation. The speakers, you did a great job. It was uh, three great talks. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone, and uh, see you in two weeks for the next seminar. See you in two weeks.
Okay. So, so on Andres, uh, Josephine, Sigrid, and Quentin, shall I send uh, an invite and we chat for a couple of minutes now? Yeah. Let's do that. Thank you.